Let's shift to solutions here. I'm, I'm uh, always conscious of not letting everybody get too depressed, um, and we need to turn quickly now to talking about what can we do about this. But I'm going to start by saying that the, the solutions that we have been investing in in the past century are not going to work as well going forward. I'm going to tell, give you a few reasons why. So one really important strategy used all around the world historically has been to build big reservoirs. It enables us to capture some of that water, a lot of that water that was flowing down the river and, and flowing out to the ocean so that we could put it to use, so that we could then divert it to our cities, to our farms, uh, so that we could generate electricity with it. The problem going forward is that Building another reservoir in a place that's already running out of water isn't going to make things any better because reservoirs don't create water. They just stall it out for a while. They just hold on to it temporarily so that we can utilize more of it. And so if we're already using a dangerously high volume of water relative to the rate at which it's being replenished, building reservoirs isn't necessarily going to help much. They can help give us the access to water at different times of the year or sometimes get us through a dry year and make water available in the next year. But over the long term, it doesn't make any new water. So it's not really a solution uh, to this problem of water shortages. Another strategy that we have globally invested in very heavily is water importation, the transfer of water from one place to another. I touched on this a moment ago. Uh, one of the best, il il most illustrative examples of this is what's taking place in China right now. This is a picture of the South North Water Diversion Project. Um, it's concrete tunnels and pipes and open canals that move water thousands of kilometers from the wetter southern part of the country of China and move it to the north up into areas where they have used up all of their available water supplies. The capital city of Beijing for instance, um, used up all the local water supply. They had to find some more. The North China Plain, the breadbasket of China, where they grow the vast majority of their agricultural goods, um, they have so overutilized the groundwater that many of the farmer's wells can no longer get that deep to pull that water because it's gotten so deep underground. So the Chinese solution to this, at least for now, is to build this big pipeline to move water from the wet south to the drier north, where they've run out of water. Um, this has come at, a, at an exorbitant cost. It's estimated to have spent about $80 billion to date. Uh, this is only the first of three phases of this, of this diversion project. Um, and one of the concerns is that when you do these kinds of water transfer projects, that you're just robbing, eventually you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. In other words, if you take too much water out of the southern part, and specifically this water is coming out of the Yangtze River Basin, and send it up to the north, um, then, it, then eventually you're going to have consequences for the Yangtze River itself. And so, by transferring water, we have to be careful that we're not just creating or transferring problems, that we're not spreading water scarcity by robbing the places that still had a little bit of extra water and sending it to the places that have run out of water as well as being very expensive, and also these projects require tremendous energy. In the places in the world where you have large water transfers projects like this, they are the single largest electricity users in those places. Southern California receives a lot of water coming in to the east from the Colorado River, coming from the north in Northern California, and the electricity it takes to move the water that far has made the water agency that does that water moving the single largest consumer of electricity in California. The same is true in Arizona. They built the Central Arizona Project to pull water out of the Colorado River and move it all the way across the state through Phoenix down to Tucson. The Central Arizona Project is the single largest user of electricity in Arizona. So it's tremendously energy intensive. That could lead to other environmental problems if the energy source is coming from energy producing mechanisms that generate a lot of carbon emissions, then we're just contributing to the problems of climate change, okay? So this is not going to be um, available to us, uh, at, at least not at the scale that we've utilized it previously. Another reason why we can't be moving water around is that we can't reach far enough to go find surplus water anymore. If you're, if you're embedded in one of these water scarce areas on this map, 
you'd have to build a very, very long pipeline in order to get to some place that had some surplus water, and you're going to have to deal with the politics of the local communities that are saying, no, uh-uh, you can't take our water. We're going to need that for our water future. Um, and so it's becoming very politically contentious in addition to the cost you know, that's associated with it. Another strategy that has gained a lot of favor, um, particularly in the last couple of decades, um, is either recycling our water, so we use the water in the city and instead of putting it back into the river um, or back into the lake, uh, we'll just keep reusing it um, and, and in essence requiring that we take less water out of the front end, less withdrawal, but we recycle the water, which means we have less being returned back to the system. Well, that works pretty well for cities and it makes sense in a lot of places, um, but we have to be conscious of the fact that we might be stealing some of the water that would have otherwise returned back to the source by recycling that water. It can be a useful uh, strategy in some places, though. I don't want to diminish that. Building desalination plants. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but taking the salt out of the water, the big problem there is the electricity requirements. Very, very heavy electricity requirements. It makes that water very expensive and too expensive for most uses of the water. Okay? So, for instance, we can't use it to grow lower-valued crops uh, because it simply would, would cause the farmer to go broke. The water's too expensive to use for that purpose. Um, in our research, we've compiled uh, data from a lot of different cities around the world and looked at their options for how they can rebalance their water budgets um, and looked at the different strategies, many of which I've just talked about desalting ocean water, recycling water, um, importing it from other places, using local sources of water. And this is a, this is a depiction of, of one city, the city of San Diego, as it's labeled here. And you can see from where the bars are, the, the, the graph represents the cost for each unit of water. It's here in cubic meters of water. And the numbers that are out on the far right are really expensive. So, Desalination and, and recycling tend to be on the order of maybe 10 times or more cost than some of the other options. And these are concerns because what we're finding is that in many communities, not just here in the United States, but around the world, there are some families in our, in our communities, in our societies, that simply cannot afford to pay their water bills anymore. Um, that's happening here in America, it's happening in Europe, and it's happening in a lot of other parts of the world. So we have to pay attention to what the cost of the water is. Um, and so some of these other options, so that's, you know, that says, you know, not going to be widely available, you know, for all purposes and, and, and in all places. Water importation, I touched on that, fairly expensive and people are going to have trouble with you, you know, reaching into their water accounts and taking some of their water. Um, if you're in this problem, if you're concerned about water scarcity, it's because you've already fully tapped out on your local water supplies. You've dried up your river, you're drying up your local aquifer. So those options aren't available to you. So what are we left with? Where then do we go? Well, I'll argue for the rest of this presentation that we have to go to water conservation. Um, and uh, for many, many different reasons, including the fact, and I want to point that out here from this graph, it is by far and away the most cost-effective way of dealing with a water crisis, of a water shortage problem. So I'm going I'm to highlight two big solutions here, give you a little bit of details about both of them, and then wrap it up. The first big solution is that we need to start creating water. Each and every one of us needs to start creating water. We need to start creating water within our homes, within our businesses, and out on our farms. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, what I really mean by that is each gallon that we don't consume leaves that gallon in, in the water sources, um, in the water account, and therefore becomes available to other people to use or becomes available for the support of natural ecosystems, for fish and other aquatic life, for example, to support fisheries that we depend upon. So, in essence, we can think of create, when we save water, we can think about it as creating water. We're making more water available on the supply side of the account um, that, we can, that we can put to various uses. Uh, let, me, let me show you just a couple of the, the really, really smart ways of doing this. Within cities, 
Uh, there was a very interesting bit of research that was done at uh, University of California at Davis a couple of years ago. It was actually done by a master's student. And he decided to compare the water use in cities in the western United States with cities in Australia. And he found a rather remarkable, came to a real, rather, rather remarkable conclusion was that Australian cities on average use half or less of the water being used in western U.S. cities. And so when you look into his report and his findings, here's, here's what you discover. By far the biggest reason is the difference in how much water is being used outdoors um, in these cities. In most of our western cities, half or more of all the water use is going to outdoor landscape watering. And so, and it goes to, to, to create landscapes like the one that you see on the left from Los Angeles. Bright green lawns, verdant vegetation, tropical vegetation. Um, we're creating different worlds, you know, different realities in our, in our landscape yards um, by pouring a lot of water on them. By contrast, in Australia, they've become very accustomed to using a lot less water outdoors. They've become accustomed and they like, they love their native plants, their native flowers, uh, their native shrubs. Uh, and, uh, and they require very little, if any, supplemental water. They don't have to water these plants. Uh, some have referred to this as xeriscaping, but it's basically just landscaping according to what nature provides to the best extent possible. So by far and away, this was the biggest reason why Australian cities are using a lot less water than cities in the Western United States. Interestingly, the one other factor that had a, made a significant difference was the fact that Australians have been using different types of toilets for a long time. You've probably seen these two-button toilets. Um, they're just becoming a, a more and more popular, um, being put to greater use here in the United States. But there are two buttons, either a full flush or a half flush, and you can figure out which one you're supposed to use depending upon what you've done. Um, but remarkably, this makes a difference. Uh, we flush a lot of water down our toilets. And so if, you're, if you have a mechanism to choose how much water to put down the toilet, it can actually save a good deal of water. Now, there are many, many other ways to save water within our homes and our businesses. Um, here in the United States, we have the benefit of the fact that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, labels dishwashing machines, uh, uh, clothes washing machines, uh, shower heads, faucets, that sort of thing. They label it with this label that they call water sense, and it's something to look for. When you're shopping for new fixtures for your home, new appliances, you can pay attention to this, and you can contribute substantially um, to using less water within your home by being a little bit more um, attentive to, uh, to how water gets used through these various uh, fixtures and appliances.